Okay, we were talking about um, generalized Newton's second law. Really, if you're talking about uh, Lagrange's equations, at least we're on our way. And uh, this is the second part of lecture number seven. And uh, specifically what we were talking about is taking this virtual work statement. Virtual work is equal to the summation of Fi minus Vi dot. And these are both vectors um, where I is from one to capital N dot delta R sub I. R is a vector again. And we've taken care of this term up here at top. And then now we have to take a look at this um, this reverse momentum, if you will, uh, the time rate of change of the momentum. Um, and that's the second part here that we have to worry about. And uh, we wrote it out, expanded it out with the MIVI term and then the second term, the delta R sub I. And um, I suggested that, that all right, it's one part. When you add the other part here, that it becomes one big whole. And that um, we're going to do some things with this. This will replace this term here. We'll call that term one with um, this term one plus two. And we'll subtract off then the other term, term two here. All right, so that's actually what we're going to work with. Um, to replace this for our expression. All right, enough of that. Let's go on and look at it. Okay, so if if we do what we just said, then this p dot sub i delta r sub i and its summation one to n uh, over i is actually equal to summation of i from one to cap n, same as over here, uh, one to cap n and j from one to n, lowercase n, of this whole over here, the whole part, the time derivative of MIVI dot delta R sub I, uh, partial R sub I with respect to Q sub J. Then we subtract off this part over here, MIVI dot time derivative of partial R sub I with respect to Q sub J. And then we have delta Q sub A. And this, this 11 means the 11th equation, okay. So now then, if we start using the, some of these identities, we can we can rewrite some of these terms to make better sense of really what's going on here. Remember this vi is really r sub i dot, so it's the time derivative of the motion of these individual particles that we have in our system. Okay, equation 9, we said is the time derivative of the partial of the position vector r sub k with respect to the generalized coordinates q sub l is actually the, the derivative of with respect to q sub l, partial derivative with respect to q sub l, of the partial of r sub k dot with respect to time t. Yeah, and that's where we wrote out a couple of different, we wrote this out, and we wrote this out, and then discovered that, well, lo and behold, they're the same thing. All right, so then if that's true, then we can change the subscripts from l here, to, to J, having changed from K to I. Then from equation 7, then we have partial of R sub K dot, or V sub K here, with respect to Q dot sub L. Remember how we did a Q dot sub I, and so L, and, and then said only time it ever works is when I is equal to L. Well, here it is again. And we, we found in a separate expression that that's equal to the partial of R sub K with respect to Q sub L itself, without the dot. And so then if we, we move around, change the subscripts over from K and L to I and J respectively, we get a similar sort of expression. Okay, so all we've done here is we've just, all we've done is we've just changed subscripts. And that's it. Okay, nothing fancy. All right, so then... Then what we get from the, the bottom of the last page, here's your, your rate change of time switch and momentum. It's like the, the negative of the, the Lambert's thing, dotted with delta R sub I there. And um, so this, this is what we just had found, the time derivative of the whole thing minus the, the other part. This was originally, we wrote that as time derivative of partial of R sub I with respect to Q sub J. All I've done is I've just rearranged we we'll put the time in here, so this is actually partial with respect to Q sub J of R sub I dot. Okay, so I've just reordered the derivatives, and that's all that really is. Now then, if we take a look here, this is actually 
uh, kind of peculiar because m sub i v sub i dot partial of v sub i with respect to q dot sub j. Well, if you look, the kinetic energy, right, is the sum from 1 to n, cap n, of 1 half m sub i times v sub i dotted with itself. Hmm. And then we have then the partial of t, the kinetic energy, with respect to q dot sub j. Well, that's going to be the 1 half uh, summation over 1 to n, that is. Move this out of the way if I can. Whoops. Summation from 1 to n of 1 half m sub i partial of v sub i with respect to q dot sub j. All right, q dot sub j over here. Dotted with v i plus v i dotted with partial of v sub i dot uh, partial of q sub j dot. Well, that whole thing is equal to, because we just, basically these are the same thing. So we get rid of the 1 half and we're left with summation from, one, from i from 1 to n of m sub i v sub i dot with partial of v sub i with respect to q dot sub j. Well, you notice that we got some interesting things up here. We'll worry about that later. But partial of v sub k with respect to q dot sub l or partial of v sub i with respect to q dot sub j. But more importantly, at the moment, notice that this is, this looks suspiciously similar to that, doesn't it? Okay, that's why and we can write time derivative, a partial of the kinetic energy with respect to q dot sub j. Let me look at it again here, this. Then, by showing what we did just down here below, it's partial of t with respect to q sub j dot. Well, if we take the time derivative of it, that's exactly this whole thing, including that. That's right here. All right, so then the next part, the second part here, well, let's see what we've got. Well, if we take the time derivative, time derivative, strike that, we're actually taking the derivative with respect to the coordinate itself, q sub j, say, because we would have q sub j up here. I wonder what happens. I mean, look at this. This is sort of like kinetic energy, and we've taken, uh, if we take the derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to q sub j, it might maybe it'll work out. I don't know. Well, let's see what happens. So then partial of the kinetic energy with respect to q sub j, and that's one half m sub i, uh, derivative of v sub i with respect to q sub j dot v i plus v i dot partial of v sub i with respect to q sub j. Again, these two are the same thing, more or less. It's just a dot product of a and a dot b is equal to b dot a, right? You can rearrange the two terms. So um, this is like two. This is like two times this, and then we can get rid of that term and get rid of this term, and we have just this left over. Well, this is this, with a minus sign. If I put a minus sign in here, then we get a minus sign there, and we get a minus sign here. Even with the minus sign, it still looks exactly the same. Lo and behold, that's why this is partial of the kinetic energy with respect to Q sub j. And you may start to see where we're going here. Remember what we were talking about? We were talking about the virtual work, after all, uh, all of this. And the only thing we've really been talking about is the P sub i. And we had these forces, and we said, oh, well, we, you know, we fixed all that up very quickly. And that was related back to some sort of generalized force. And, you know, and it was n from j equals 1, q sub j, partial q sub j, where this, this n and j, we're talking about the generalized coordinates. Right? And then this second part, well, that comes from the the time derivative of this of this linear momentum. That's all due to the to the Dedan Bears assumption or this just the fact that the thing is moving. It's not statically you know, it's not static anymore. Okay, so then if you know, look here real closely, we've got Q sub J here and then Q sub J here, delta Q sub J in particular. So we can group on this. We can pull this over inside of here and then write Q sub J minus and there's a minus there here minus the time derivative, time derivative from up here, partial of t with respect to q dot sub j plus partial of t with respect to q sub j, delta q sub j, and that all has to be equal to zero because the virtual work has to be equal to zero. Now, did I say how large each delta q j is? Notice that this is very similar to Just like for statics, did I say how large each delta Q is? No. 
They're not zero, but they are arbitrary. So no matter what, this is always supposed to be true, regardless of what each of these are for every j from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way through to n. So uh, what that means is, is that this, this isn't equal to zero, but this part here has to be equal to zero. In other words, q sub j minus the time derivative of partial of t with respect to q dot sub j plus partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to q sub j. This is like the, the time derivative of the generalized coordinate. All of them there. And then this is just the generalized coordinates by itself, isn't it? So then that's for each of these. Those are going to be equal to zero. If we rewrite, and you put the Q over on the right hand side, this is our Lagrange equation. Or in other words, Lagrange's equations. Notice that his kinetic energy here, and we're not using we're not using the Lagrangian yet. We'll talk about that here just very shortly. But the thing of it is, is that we do have the generalized forces over on the right hand side that we have to worry about. And the generalized forces can be identified from the fact that they're the part of the virtual work that corresponds to the external forces. So this is Lagrange's equations for a system with kinetic energy and all external forces described by the virtual work function delta W, external forces, that's what they're supposed to stand for, is equal to the sum from 1 to cap n of F sub i delta R sub i. And this cap n, of course, then is, is due to all the different applied forces on all the little particles. And that's equal to, okay, so this is a particle count. And this is actually generalized, oops, well, it's generalized coordinates count. Okay, so that's how the ends are different. Notice that we have a dot product here and you have to worry about the vectors. Here we don't have to worry about vectors, but q sub j and then cap q sub j and lowercase q sub j are always in the same direction. For a real analysis, what we'll do is we'd actually use this equation to find q sub j uh, for j equals 1, 2, 3, all the way through to n, because if we know these forces are being applied, we can find what r sub i are take the dot product, um, expand in terms of our generalized coordinates q sub j, and whatever we have multiplying against each of those, that's going to be the cap q for that particular lowercase q sub j. Okay. So this is an important equation to help us find q sub j, the generalized forces. Now some of these forces can be conservative and therefore can be written in terms of a potential function. And this is where we're going to get back to our Lagrange's equation. So we don't have to do nece this necessarily for all of these. What we're going to see is, is this really, we only have to do this for non-conservative forces. And then we can use a potential energy function V for all of the conservative forces. And if you remember from last time, I wrote the, talked about that if we have general, general or the virtual work, Okay, virtual work is equal to the negative virtual, um, the virtual operator on the potential energy function, plus this, the sum from 1 to n, cap n that is, of the externally applied forces that happen to be non-conservative, dotted with the virtual displacements, and that's equal to the virtual work done by the external forces. Remember the forces of constraint don't do any work. So these, the virtual work done by external ex external forces is equal to all of this, right? Minus delta V plus summation from J of, of, of J from 1 to N of Q prime, okay, sub J delta Q J. Notice the prime here, okay, that implies we're talking about non-conservative generalized forces. So we put all the conservative generalized forces over here in our potential energy function. You either have to do one or the other.
but not both. Okay, so you either must use your your forces, put all of your conservative forces in V, leave your non-conservatives in Q prime of J, put some of the conservative forces in V, put the rest of the conservative forces in Q prime sub J along with the non-conservative forces, or don't use this at all and use this equation along with what we did before. It's up to you, but you cannot put the forces in both because that just means that you're counting it twice. All right, so let's look at the potential energy uh, function again. The potential energy was a function of R1, R2. This is basically just our configuration, right? No, notice that there's no there's no d dependence on time. In a more generalized form of this derivation, we could write in time. We could write in R I dot of the potential energy as a function of the velocity. But those sort of situations are really quite unusual. And, and to be honest with you, the f physical, the occasions that they come up are really not that physical anyway. So in any case, when we talk about having a virtual operator on the potential energy function, well, we'd have this original function, and we have this, this chain rule again, partial of V with respect to R sub J dot delta R sub J. And we have a summation from, of J from 1 to N over all of our, our coordinates here, isn't it? A generalized coordinates, that is. And then if we take the partial of a potential energy function with respect to r sub j, well, we could expand this delta r sub j in terms of the generalized coordinates, and we get i from 1 to n, um, and partial of r sub j with respect to q sub i, delta q sub i, right? And then we end up being able to say that this is equal to the partial of the potential energy partial potential energy with respect to Q sub I, delta Q sub I, right? Because we're going to collapse out this delta R sub J with that delta R sub J, a partial R sub J. And so we end up with the four overall work. This was originally minus delta V. Overall work done by external forces then is minus some from one to N partial of V with respect to Q sub I, delta Q sub I, plus 1 to N so over J of Q prime sub J, delta Q sub J. And that's equal to then, notice we've got delta Q sub J on both terms here. We've got summations over both terms here. And in fact, this has to be, I'm very sorry, but uh, this N, that N has to be a lowercase N. Okay, so the summation is over J from 1 to N of all of this oh, multiplied against delta QJ. So instead of just writing Q sub J without a prime, notice the prime is missing in equation 12, we get minus partial of V with respect to Q sub I plus Q prime sub J. Notice the prime. Q prime sub J is the non-conservative part of Q sub J. The conservative part, well, it's in here. All right, so if we put that in there, then what we end up with then, if we actually put it back into the into our original equation, then we end up with Q sub I prime minus partial of V with respect to Q sub J. That's, see, that's where that's coming from. And we've changed now from using I to using J. And I'm sorry, that's not the right I. This is actually the, the correct J there, isn't it? So we've gone from using that this i over here to using j down here and we have q sub i prime and this has to be j sorry q sub j prime minus partial of v with respect to q sub j minus the time derivative of partial of cap t the kinetic energy with respect to q j dot plus partial of t with respect to q j and this this just comes from p dot right our p dot j. This is from our the momentum, the time derivative of the momentum, and that goes now. If we rearrange things a bit, we says partial of with respect to time of q time derivative of t with respect to q j dot. That's this term minus the partial of t with respect to q j. That's this term, right? Plus so then a minus a minus partial of V is 50 QJ, so we're grouping V and T together here in this in this term here. And then that's all equal to Q 
sub j prime for j equals 1, 2, 3, 4, because it didn't say how big delta q sub j is for all all j in 1, 2, 3, all the way in from whatever j happens to be from 1 to n. Okay, so if we define, define the Lagrangian as L equals T minus V, so if we say that this in here, well, we're going to be lazy, and we're going to say that's T minus V, then partial value with respect to Q dot sub J is equal to the, the derivative of T with respect to Q dot sub J, because the derivative of this potential energy with respect to Q dot J is equal to zero. Notice it's only a function of position. It's only a function of position. It's only a function of position. It's not a function of velocity at all generalized coordinates or anything else. So this will actually automatically fall out. So we can actually be lazy and we can just replace this with L because we mean to say this T minus V and the partial of V with respect to Q dot J, well that's just always going to be equal to zero. So then what we end up with is finally the Lagrangian's equations. The time derivative of the partial of Lagrangian with respect to Q dot J minus the partial of Lagrangian with respect to QJ is equal to Q prime sub J non-conservative for j from 1, 2, 3, all the way through to n, because for all this is for all of our generalized coordinates, and we find what q prime sub j is by using the virtual work statement, the non-conservative work that's done by application of external forces that are non-conservative dotted against virtual displacements is equal to q prime sub j delta q sub j, where the summation here is over the generalized coordinates, the summation over i, is over each of the vectors to each of our particles. Alrighty, so then this is Lagrange's equations for a system of n particles or n generalized coordinates. n particles, capital N that is, n generalized coordinates, lowercase n, with conservative forces described by the pot potential function v. So we've put the potential function in here and that describes our conservative forces. Okay, let's look at some examples. And you can look through and see many, many examples in Barra. If you have any problems with that, there's actually uh, Shom's outline on Lagrangian dynamics. Okay, and there must be thousands of textbooks on Lagrangian dynamics because if you don't know how to do Lagrangian dynamics, as an engineer, you're in deep duty. Okay, so anyway, that's from the Barrows book, and hope you find that useful. All right, other examples. Uh, sorry about the fault, small print here. Um, let's see if I can, what I'm gonna do is actually zoom into this a bit. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, zoom in. Okay, we've got a hoop rolling down an inclined plane as shown here. It's a, a mass m, okay? So the hoop itself has a mass m, has a radius lowercase r, and then the coordinate going down, the coordinate direction down the, the inclined plane is x. This is phi, and then from where it's starting out, I'm gonna say that that's phi, so this angle here, and here in front, that's phi, okay. So, if we look at this, then what do we get? If we look at what we can find here, and the way you use Lagrange's equations, all right, is we know we have to find the Lagrangian. It's going to be the kinetic energy minus potential energy. And in this kinetic energy, we have to find one half, let's say you have mass of a particular body. Um, if you have just one particle, it's just mass m, r dot, dotted with itself. Okay. Don't forget to do the vector form. If you don't, then you'll miss cross terms. You'll see what I'm talking about later on, especially if you screw this up. If you if you forget to do this, then you are going to be in deep deep duty. You do not want to write one half mv squared because it's just never going to come out to be correct. 
So you have to use a vector form, otherwise it, it, it just won't just won't come out right. All right, so then if you have to do this for, say, several particles, well, you just add them all up. I equals 1 to the cap n of 1 half m sub i r sub i dot dot producted with itself. Okay, no more, no less. That's not too bad. Okay, so a hoop of radius r and mass m is rolling without slipping down an inclined plane at angle phi. Find the equation of motion for the generalized coordinates. In this particular case, what we have is we actually have translation of this mass. So we have um, we have linear momentum, and also we have angular momentum, don't we? Because we have um, rotation, and we also have translation. It's going to be translating along x, and it's going to be rotating um, with theta dot. So we have to worry about a couple of different things. One, one thing we have to worry about is the fact that you have this mass that has kinetic energy as it's rolling because you have one half mx dot. And the way they've written this example out, they've actually skipped this step, and that would just make me f upset me if you do that. What I pretty much prefer you to do is to come up here and say draw draw a vector to the center of the hoop, try to figure out where that what that is written as, and then figure out what r dot dot parted with itself is. It turns out then it's not too bad to find because this, this, this hoop isn't very moving vertically, it's only moving horizontally. And so for linear translation it does turn out to be just mx double mx dot squared. For the rotation however, we've got um, we've got to worry about the the rotational inertia of the system r i, don't we? And um, for the kinetic energy for that it would be one half i theta dot squared and again uh, it can be a challenge to find that. We'll show you some examples in class that are more entertaining than this, but this is just to get you started. All right, so there's the kinetic energy for the system, and in fact we can we can relate if there's no slipping. See, we can relate what x and theta are. It turns out that x is really equal to r theta, isn't it? Go back up and look at the picture. If if it rolls down this far, this this is actually r theta. Well, that's also equal to x, isn't it? Yeah, well, okay. So then we can substitute in for x dot because r isn't changing, the radius of the hoop isn't changing, so it's r theta dot. And then this, um, in this case, it's mr squared for a hoop because all the mass is concentrated around the radius, so then it's the mass of the hoop times r squared uh, for our um, angular moment of inertia about the, about the axis perpendicular to the hoop. This they're actually exactly the same expression, and we've got one half in front of both of them, so it just ends up being m r squared theta dot squared, just like that. The potential energy, well, remember, potential energy, if you ever end out, then it is always, uh, the potential energy is always minus f dot dr, where r naught it represents our datum, and then r is where it's ending up. In this case, if you treat this, say for example our datum, then you can measure up from there and get what your datum is. You can also use the datum as where the particle is, where the hoop is starting out. That's what's been done here, where it's been starting out, and this is, represents our h, if you will, um, along the direction of the vector g, and the the separation and angle between them is sine phi, and so we end up with, um, if you work this out, it's mgs r theta where we substitute in x equals r theta and that's against multiplied against sine phi. So Lagrangian is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy that's equal to mr uh, squared phi dot theta dot squared I should say minus mg sine phi times the quantity s minus r theta. So one thing about this you'll notice is that there's only one degree of freedom. You can't work the problem out so that you don't have to worry about this until the very end. It'll give you a kind of strange result and probably will give you this as a consequence of one of the equations of motion anyway because again you only have one degree of freedom if you have no slipping. The problem is more fun if you try to leave uh, slipping in. If you apply Lagrange's equation to, to Lagrangian then it's just a time derivative of partial value with respect to theta dot minus partial value with respect to theta is equal to 2 mr squared theta dot minus mgr sine uh, phi is equal to zero. So the mass is in both problems, and so it's 2r squared theta double dot minus gr sine phi, and we can rearrange, and you get th uh, theta double dot is equal to one half 
uh, 1 over 2 r times g times sine phi. Mm. So you can integrate this a couple of times and find the solution. It's not bad at all. Really, it's very easy to solve. Okay. You can see some other examples on here. Uh, we have uh, a vertical pendulum that you can work out of circle rolling on a cylindrical path. Okay, the complete solution is provided in here for you. Uh, one thing to note again is a uh, cylinder rolling on a circular path. It's always entertaining to try to figure out just how, say, phi and theta are related to each other. It can be a challenge sometimes if, if there's uh, no slipping. Always remember that if this thing is rolling, then the path traced out here is r phi, right? And that same distance is equal to, in this case, notice that r is all the way out here. That's also equal to r theta, right? But you always must be careful and figure out how is phi defined. Is it from the vertical? Or is it from If you go back and look, you can see an example in lecture number three where we worry about a very similar problem where I said that, all right, 2r phi is equal to r theta. And if you look at it, it doesn't make any sense, probably. And that's because, actually, in that particular problem, r theta is equal to 3r phi, okay, minus r phi. And then, well, of course, it turns out that 2r phi is equal to r theta. The reason is, is that the in this particular case, the, the fact that we've defined phi from the radial line changes where, how this point is defined. So it's something that you have to really consider. Okay, let me scribble that out because it's not particularly how it's desi designed here. So be careful about that. Give some thought to it and ask questions if you don't understand. Find the equation of the motion for a particle's mass m in three-dimensional space for different uh, coordinates, rectangular, cylindrical, and, and spherical. Rectangular coordinates, uh, spherical, and so forth. Not too bad to do, because if you're doing for the velocity, then um, at least you're not having to find acceleration in all of these things, are you? Let's see. Uh, what else have we got? Oops, sorry. Here's cylindrical coordinates. Here's our kinetic energy and cylindrical coordinates. And so forth. Look, I tell you what, uh, go through this, uh, go through the PDF file by yourself and see how you go with this, these particular examples. And we'll talk about uh, s uh, these kinds of problems in, in the lecture itself um, when we meet. You can go, but go through these by yourself. Um, they are quite helpful in learning how all these things work. And uh, some of these are kind of interesting problems in and of themselves. Thanks very much.